Good morning and welcome to Coffee with MDIFW. My name is Katie Yates and I'm a public relations specialist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Coffee with MDIFW is a monthly series where I'm meeting with different staff from our department to chat about recreation, management, and conservation over some coffee. Today I am catching up with Francis Browdigan, Director of Fisheries and Hatcheries, to talk about Maine's unique fisheries, including strategic planning and including a strategic planning update, tools for understanding the fishing laws and ways the public can support our fisheries in Maine. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation at any time by typing in your questions or comments in the chat box. We will answer questions as, times, as time allows. And just as a reminder, this video is recorded and will be available on the department's YouTube cha channel for you to watch later. So Francis, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining me. Hey Katie, I'm doing great. It's nice to be here. So before we get started, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your position with the department? Sure. So even though I'm not a Maine native, um, I like to think of myself as one. And since I've been here um, in the state, really since about the age of nine, um, my parents actually immigrated over from, uh, from Holland and um, spent most of my life uh, in the Great New Gloucester area where I grew up. What's really interesting, I think, is I've always had this real keen interest in fishing, hunting, and trapping, even though those weren't necessarily interests that were, um, that were part of my family or part of my upbringing. Um, and I also remember in, uh, when I think back, you know, when I was in high school, thinking about, geez, what am I going to do with, uh, with my career path? And, and the uh, Great New Gloucester High School at the time, they had this cool little computer. I mean, and actually, if I think back to when that was, I mean, so that would have been in 81, thereabouts. Um, you know, there weren't a whole lot of computers, but they had this computer um, where basically you could enter in some information about your interests and skills, and it would generate a list of um, career paths. So I put in the information and, and up popped this, uh, this career path um, called Gamekeeper. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of cool and didn't really know much about it. And so I started to look at available universities where I might be able to learn how to be a gamekeeper and saw that uh, UMaine offered a, a really good program in wildlife management. So, um, so I enrolled in that program and uh, really quite interesting because after my freshman year, um, I decided, well, you know, if I really want to be successful, I need to start to develop uh, uh, some skills, some real life experiences. So I started looking for a summer job my first freshman year, year after college. And, and I actually went to um, the Southern Maine IFNW headquarters to see if they were interested in hiring somebody for the summer. And I went in there looking for wildlife biologists, but there were no wildlife biologists in the office. There were just uh, the fishery staff. And they said, hey, can we help you? I said, well, I'm looking for a summer job. I'm interested in wildlife. And they said, well, we don't know if wildlife's really looking for anybody, but, but we are. We, you know, we'd like to, to find somebody to help us with some of our fisheries work. Are you interested? And I said, I don't know. Anyways, long story short, I said, yeah, I'm going to try it. So I signed up. And um, I'll tell you, after that first summer, I was just hooked on fisheries. <laughs> I said, I, I know where I want to end up, um, not necessarily where I am right here, but I definitely want a career path in, in, the, uh, in the fisheries field. And so when I, when I look back, I've got almost 33 years in, um, in the field of natural resource management. Most of that has really been with Maine Civil Service. Um, I've held several positions with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. And I've held also four positions with the Division of Fisheries and Hatcheries within the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. The last position I held uh, before becoming director about four and a half years ago, I was working as uh, the regional uh, fishery supervisor in the Sebago Lake region. So when, when you look at my role in the division, it's, it's really to oversee both the fishery side and the biological the, the, the fisheries uh, biological staff, as well as the, the hatchery programs. And I have uh, uh, two individuals, Joe Overlock and, um, and uh, Todd Langevin that really help support our management of both the, the biologists and, and our fish culture facilities. A lot of my focus is on really the administrative um, needs within the division. And so I spend time, um, you know, working and developing and planning for state and federal budgets um, many people may not realize this, but um, the vast majority of funding that, uh, that supports our, our fisheries biologists 
um, actually comes through sport fish restoration funds. Those are federal funds that are actually derived from taxes imposed on uh, fishing goods. So when you go out and you buy a fishing rod or a tackle box, those revenues come back and are redistributed to the states to, to fund uh, fisheries management and conservation programs. And there's, with any kind of a funding um, program like that, there's reporting requirements and, and so forth that we've got to comply with. So I spend a lot of time ensuring that we're, we're meeting all those expectations and making sure that we've got a balanced budget. Uh, I'm also involved in developing and presenting uh, testimony to the legislature, both uh, legislative initiatives that are developed from within the agency um, as well as responding to uh, legislative um, bills, um, you know, that are in play. Um, I spend a considerable amount of time uh, collaborating, coordinating with many of our other uh, state and federal fisheries agencies, um, agencies like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, NOAA. Um, I spend a lot of time coordinating with our sister state agency, the Department of Marine Resources, working on invasive issues with our Department of Environmental Protection, and also spend a lot of time coordinating uh, special projects with, um, with our non-governmental uh, partners as well. And a lot of that coordination is just to ensure that, you know, all of the agencies, all the partners work can be accomplished in a way that's supportive of one another's um, interests and, and missions. And that's really, really important to try to minimize areas of potential conflict and, and try to create a very supportive environment. I also spend a fair amount of time administering our rulemaking process. Um, anybody that's looked at our fishing law book knows that we have a, uh, an interest in, in, uh, in rulemaking uh, to conserve and manage our, our state fisheries. Um, I also spend a lot of time really providing some vision and direction for, uh, for the division. Um, and that includes the development of work programs in terms of where we focus our time and attention. Um, right now we're in the midst of long range uh, strategic planning. Um, I'm heavily involved in that process as well. The department and the division also establishes policy, which is really nothing more than kind of sideboards on, on how we should be doing some of the work that we do uh, to ensure that um, we're doing that in a way that's consistent and considerate of, um, of all of the interests that, that are out there. And I would say another really important role that I have is, is really serving as a li liaison with our commissioner on behalf of the division. Uh, our commissioner um, is a liaison with the governor's office and my programs through me are, are a liaison with our commissioner. Um, so really I, I get to work on all the real fun stuff, you know, when I was in college thinking about what I'd be doing as a fisheries biologist, I would dare say that none of these things that I just listed here were on my list of things that I was interested in doing. But I will say the last four and a half years, um, I have enjoyed a lot of the challenges associated with the role. And, um, and uh, I look forward to, to leading this, uh, this division in the future, Katie. Thank you. Well, I, you've got tons of experience, so you could probably tell me better than anyone about Maine's unique fisheries. What's so great about them? Yeah, this is kind of one of my favorite questions that, that I get asked um, because it gives me an opportunity to gloat a little bit. <laughs> and, and it's coming from the perspective of you know, what's available to states south of here. And, um, and I regularly get together with, um, with the directors in, in the Northeast and um, and then I often reflect back on what we have for resources here. And I think, oh man, are we blessed and lucky. <laughs> what we have here in this state, we've got an abundance of clean, clear water. And again, you don't see that heading south of here. Um, we've got a lot of water, including upwards of 600 lakes and ponds, 6,000 lakes and ponds. We've got uh, over 32,000 miles of rivers and streams. And in those waterways, these cold, clear waterways, they really support what I consider to be a unique assemblage of native salmon and trout. And they include species like brook trout, landlocked Atlantic salmon, Arctic char. And, and these fisheries really are not available anywhere else in the United States, but they're here. Um, we've got over 700 wild brook trout ponds. You know, other states are lucky to have some. We've got 700. Um, we've got the only endemic populations of Arctic char in the, in the lower 48. 
Um, we've also got endemic populations of landlocked Atlantic salmon. And those Atlantic salmon um, have actually been um, sent, or at least eggs of those salmon have been sent all around the United States and the world to help support management programs in other, in other places. So it's really not surprising with all of this that you know, Maine's really a, a recognized, nationally recognized fishing, fishing destination. And even though you know, brook trout really do rule in this state, um, if you look at angler preference surveys, brook trout is still the, uh, the most preferred sport fish. Um, bass fishing um, is, is also very, very popular. And when I talk to bass anglers, particularly those that, uh, that do a lot of fishing out of state, they always tell me and remark on, on how good our bass fisheries are here in, the, in this state. Um, and I think another element, when I think about fishing in Maine, it's not so much about just the fish. Yeah, to some people, it's just about the fish. But for most of us and a lot of us, it's really about the, the natural landscape and the setting where we're actually able to fish. And I think uh, Maine's landscape uh, being quite rural and relatively undeveloped, it really provides that backdrop I, that a lot of anglers, both local and those from away, that are really looking for as part of that, that overall experience fishing here in the, in the state. Yeah, thank you. So earlier you hinted at this, and, and so I know you're wrapping up the 15-year strategic plan for fisheries. So can you tell me a little bit about what that is, what that means, uh, how it will protect these great fisheries, and what it means for anglers? Yeah, I know when people start hearing like planning, strategic, <laughs> they probably start to dial out a little bit. Um, but it's a really, really important um, uh, work program need. And we only undertake this about once every 15 years um, because it really sets the tone and stage for our future work programs. We really took a whole new approach to strategic planning uh, this time around. And we really tried to create what I view as more of a public centric approach. Um, we have a steering committee, a public steering committee that's providing oversight through the whole process uh, we've pulled together work groups to help frame up uh, goals and objectives that are developed in the plan. And I'd like to think of the plan as, as sort of having three um, important priorities or goals. Um, one being, we want the public to know what we're doing, how we're structured, and how we operate. So one component of the plan will highlight how, how we're organized and all of the work that we generally do as a division. A second important piece of, of the plan that probably most people are most interested in is really the development of action items or, or the goals, the objectives and the action items that support management of our most important game fish here in the state. And really what those, uh, what those action items uh, allow us to do is really focus on the research, conservation, management, stocking needs for those different species of fish looking into the future in terms of what do we need to know? What are the limitations? What are the challenges we have? And how can we, how can we successfully manage those resources? And then I would say a third component that I view as an important goal or priority in this planning process, and I think this is a really good one, and I think the public will really welcome this, is um, we're going to be embarking on a, a stakeholder supported, a public supported, development of water specific management plans. And what that means is, I mean, let me back up for a minute. So for a lot of people, you know, when they listen to proposed regulation changes that might be initiated by the department um, or stocking changes, they're always thinking, well, how is this affecting me? How is this affecting where I fish? So what we're going to be doing on the waters that are most important in the state that, you know, receive the highest level of use we're gonna systematically um, adopt and develop management plans using public stakeholder uh, work groups. So that at the end of the day, there'll be support for our management programs on those individual waters. One of the biggest challenges we have right now on a lot of our lakes and ponds that don't have water specific management plans is we get lots of requests annually, particularly on our bigger waters like Sebago and Moosehead to take on these, these new regulations for reasons that are not always in alignment with the management on those waters, or at least the management identified by our staff. 
So the idea is to craft a, a document um, on those most important waters where we have full support of, of the public. Um, and that will provide really a good platform for evaluating the merit of future proposals, whether it be stocking or rulemaking. So long story short, a really important component of our future um, uh, planning process uh, that I think the public will really um, welcome. So to date, we've got about three quarters of the plan drafted. We're actually gonna be meeting in a couple of weeks um, with the, our steering committee, our public steering committee to review um, several additional plan components uh, focused on hatchery goals, some broader general goals uh, for the, the operation of the division that aren't specific to key um, you know, sport fish. And then what I had mentioned in reference to about our operation and structure, we've got a document that kind of outlines all the work that we're doing there. Now you ask, you know, how does this plan protect our, our state's important fisheries? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, I think the most important thing that this plan will do is it will actually help and support the development of regional work plans. So in other words, we'll be developing regional work plans based on all of those action items that we developed in the plan. And, and the reason this is really important is um, there are a lot of distractions in this world. There's a lot of um, areas within the world, within the realm of fisheries management that the public would like us to work on. And it's really, but it's really important that we remain focused on, on those most important priorities that are gonna really best serve the long-term management and conservation of the fisheries of the state. Um, as to benefits to the anglers, um, I guess I look at that as number one, there's a huge benefit right now just with the public participation element of the development of this plan. And then I would suggest that in the implementation of the plan, the public will have additional opportunity uh, to be involved, particularly with the development of water specific management plans. Um, and again, the really the biggest focus of this plan and benefit is really kind of allowing the department to really focus its limited resources where they're really most needed. Thank you, Francis. Uh, will people at home be able to see this when it's complete? Absolutely. So as part of this, uh, this public uh, process, once we have a, um, a draft plan, we actually plan to go to a, a technical editor uh, to make the plan um, easy to understand and digestible for public use. Um, at that point, we'll actually um, have that plan, make that plan available for public review and comment. And uh, we'll probably do that by way of an email blast. So for people that have purchased uh, fishing licenses um, from us in the past, and we have your email address and we'll be using that email address to, to notify you of this opportunity. Great, thanks. And so moving on, uh, there's a ton of questions about our fishing laws coming through the chat. And uh, so I'll just ask with so many unique fisheries and different species to protect and manage in Maine that are unique to Maine, I guess our laws can seem complex. Why is that? Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons um, why that is. And um, I'll start with one that I think is really important uh, for the public to appreciate and understand. They probably already do. But really all of our waters are different. Um, they're shaped differently. They've got different fisheries communities. Their productivity is different. The, the chemistry is different. Um, and because we have such a, um, a committed and passionate um, staff um, interested in providing the best possible fishing opportunities that they can, they really work to try to customize the management on all of these waters around the state to provide really opportunities that are requested by the public. And I would say some of the complexity really originates because we have been very responsive to public input regarding new initiatives and, and new opportunities. In fact, I would even say that that's been a little bit challenging in and of itself in that by increasing angling opportunities, we're also still stri trying to strive the balance in ensuring that conservation interests are also being met. 
So for example, you know, a, an example of this would be um, fall fishing opportunity in the northern part of the state. So the northern part of the state supports the vast majority of our cold water fisheries. So many of those waters, most of those waters are really close to fall fishing uh, as a protective preventative measure while those fish are spawning. But we do have a number of waters that are open to fishing in the fall. Those are predominantly stocked waters and waters that support warm water fisheries that are not spawning in the fall. And, but because we want to create those opportunities, we have to create them in the law book as exemptions. So, you know, it's, it's no fall fishing is kind of a general rule of thumb. And then we have all these exemptions where, well, but you can go fishing here, here, and there. And the same is true with the use of live fish as bait. We've got waters where you can use live fish as bait. We've got other waters you can't use live fish as bait. So trying to manage the complexity of that in the law book really um, adds to, um, I think, some of the challenges in packaging a law book that's, that's easy to navigate. The other aspect that people um, probably forget about, sometimes we do, although we've tackled it, so not anymore, but you know, the fisheries division and the hatcheries division, fisheries and hatcheries divisions really been in place since the 1950s. And there's been an awful lot of rulemaking that's taken place since then. And so there's a lot of different rules that are in the law book. There isn't necessarily a high degree of consistency in the language with all of those rules. And really all of those, all of these items that I just talked about are all reasons why we've seen increased complexity um, in, in the law book and in the laws. And it's why we do hear from the public regarding this concern. And I know that you and, and your team have been working really hard to provide some tools to make it easier for people to dig through the law book and, and decipher some of it. Uh, can you give some examples of those? Yeah. Um, I will say right at the start that um, when I think about my history with the department, if I had to like identify the most, uh, the biggest, most common complaint, it, it is the law book and the complexity of the law book. And it's for that very reason, over the last eight, maybe 10 years, uh, the Division of Fisheries and Hatcheries has made real significant investments to overcome that public concern, because we do not want our laws or our law book to be complicated. We do not want our laws and law book to be in, in any way a barrier to people getting out and enjoying the great fishing opportunities that we have in the state. So some of the efforts that we've undertaken um, include, we've gone through and, and we've really done a lot of restructuring and reorganizing within the law book. That may not mean a whole lot to people, but but we've really tried to create um, a, a cleaner understanding of how to navigate the law book. And we've also organized our special regulations alphabetically to provide a little bit more um, of an intuitive approach and, and how to understand some of the laws that may be in place on the waters that you fish. We've also looked at some of our more complicated rules that are in the law book and done, I think, a pretty, uh, pretty good job at simplifying these complex rule structures that were out there. Um, again, just so it's a little less intimidating for the angler when he's looking to fish a water body uh, to be able to navigate what we have in play. And we really tried to focus on what was the most important conservation needs as we looked at simplification. There was a time that our fishing law book looked more like a magazine. And uh, it was a time when we included a lot of advertisements to help pay for the production of the fishing law book. And um, we actually got a lot of negative feedback from the public uh, because they found it was difficult to navigate around all those ahead's and find the laws that they needed to understand in order to go fishing. So the law book that we have now and, uh, that's available is, has been stripped of all advertisements and it's pretty much just the laws. We even pulled out a lot of the, um, a lot of the outreach and messaging that we had in our law book that's now available in a main fishing guide document, but we have retained some of that um, of where that outreach is probably more, more critical. But for the most part, we've really leaned it down to just the laws. Um, we've definitely increased consistency in language. We've gone through it and we've made sure that the same verbiage is being used consistently throughout the law book. I think the biggest, the most significant investment we've made, and it's probably taken 
better part of you know five years is really in the digital arena in the electronic arena and it's really with the development of our fishing regulation database again that doesn't sound really exciting but being able to manage fishing regulations provides you a lot of really cool exciting opportunities and not only has the regulations database allowed us to develop our own law book which has by the way way fewer errors than our old law books were when we used to have those produced outside the agency but it's allowed for the development of these digital tools that help anglers navigate our, our fishing laws. I think perhaps one of the most prominent recent tools that we've added, um, we call it the float tool, fishing laws online angling tool. And what it is basically, it's a, it's a tool showcasing the map of the state of the main, um, gives you the opportunity to click on a water and, um, and you can determine if there are any special regulations are in effect or by virtue of the, the shading, it'll let you know whether you're in the north zone or in the south zone. And, and then you can click on the, uh, the general law regulations for that zone to get that information. A really, really cool tool. Um, and actually, if you're set up and you've got good cell coverage, even if you don't know the name of the water, um, it'll show you where you are on the map. A second tool that we came up with, which is really um, a value to the angling public as well, um, and it's pretty easy for the public to use. Not every not everybody wants to, to generate, you know, or carry even a, a complete fishing law book. And we get lots of requests every year from the public wanting to know, well, you know, where are all your fly fishing only waters or you know, where are all your whatever waters? You know, I want all the waters in the town of Gray. And, so what we did was we created this sorting tool. It's, it's also on our website. And um, we've got um, opportunities there for the public to sort by town, by water, by regulation, by county, by fishing zone. And you can actually identify the waters that you're interested in in terms of knowing what the regulations are. And then you can just print those out or you can save them to your iPhone or, or whatever. So that's another great tool. Um, and I think both of those tools have, have really been influential in providing um, less discomfort in terms of understanding what the fishing laws are that's in, are in place. I'll also add, I, I believe we've also convened recently a fishing laws panel discussion, Katie, that may, may offer a little bit more detail on some of those tools that, that I just mentioned. Um, but I will say, you know, when I look at other states and where they're at in managing fishing regulations and providing information about um, how to navigate their law book and how to interpret their fishing regulations, I would say that the state of Maine right now is, is a leader in, in its efforts to manage regulations in the digital format. We've got other states that are looking very closely at what we've done and trying to do the same thing. Um, there's a recognition that, again, we, we don't want our laws to become barriers for people to go fishing. And we recognize, too, that in our, in our zest and our quest to provide well-managed fisheries and to conserve, particularly in this state, you know, the wonderful native fishery resources we have, there's going to be some inherent complexity in our fishing laws. But I do feel that reducing our reliance on and the cost associated with printing the law books and utilizing more digital formats is going to allow the public to be much more comfortable with the fishing laws that are in place. And at the end of the day, there's a real savings in terms of cost to the department as well. So it's, a, it's really a win-win. And it's for those reasons why other states are really looking very closely at what Maine's done. Thank you. And we did post the links to those tools in the chat. So everyone, if you haven't had an opportunity to check them out, you certainly, I encourage you to do so. They are really helpful. I always use the float tool when I go fishing and I will confirm that we do have a lot of zest for our quest. So, <laughs> Francis, um, an area of concern for the fishing and non-fishing public, and it has come up in the chat a little bit, um, are, is the issue of invasive aquatic species. Um, so is that a concern in Maine? And what are some of the ways the department is working to stop the spread of invasives? Oh, yeah, it's a big issue in this state. Um, you know, and there's a lot of terms floating around, invasives, exotics, non-natives. Um, when I think of the term invasive, it's really when a fish is introduced. It might be a fish that's native to the state, might be a fish that's from away. 
um, that basically has an adverse interaction with with our native fish communities and and those interactions are socially unacceptable and and I think to understand and appreciate the threat that invasives pose in this state because it is really I would say up there if not the most important threat facing the conservation of our native fish it's really having to understand um, our native trout and salmon and and how how those communities evolve kind of post glaciation and i'm not going to go into a seminar on this but i want to do want to make an important point you know most of our cold water uh, salmonid fisheries evolved in the absence of, of of complex fish communities they actually evolved in very very simple fish communities and our trout and salmon just just do not coexist very well with other species of fish so when fish are introduced um, they, they are often adversely impacted. And it's not to say that every new introduction poses the same level of threat or risk, um, but just that by the nature of their, their evolution on the landscape, they just do not compete well with other species, particularly warm water species of fish like pike and smallmouth bass. Um, and so as a result, uh, that, you know, we've got these phenomenal cold water fisheries in the state. We know invasive species represent a huge threat. It's probably not a surprise that we've made some real significant investments to protect our native fisheries. And, and, and I'll give you some examples, but just generally they include um, regulatory um, changes, statutory changes, it includes outreach, and also detect, includes um, efforts to detect invasive species and also efforts um, to eradicate invasive species. So there's a lot there and there's probably more that should and needs to be done, but I'll just quickly highlight some examples that encompass kind of our overall program to combat invasives. So we do have very stiff penalties that are in play right now with regard to um, illegal unauthorized stalking in the state, um, penalties upwards of $10,000 if, if you're found guilty. Uh, we've got other other rules that are in place that include uh, making it illegal to dump your bait because sometimes people don't realize this, but when they're dumping their bait, they're also dumping other things that may be mixed in with their bait. And that's that's why it's illegal to dump bait fish in the state. Um, it's also illegal to import bait fish in the state. Um, we're one of the few states that's restricted bait fish importation. And that's really huge because once again, when baits come in from out of the state, you don't know what else is in that water that's holding that bait fish. And it could be anything from um, invasive aquatic plants, invasive aquatic invertebrates like zebra mussels and, and spiny water fleas. It could be fish pathogens. So it's a really important law. And it's why people will hear me, they get a little confused because you know the agency talks about the importance of bait fish and, um, and fishing and harvesting locally. But a lot of that stems from concerns that if we don't provide a good supply of bait fish to support traditional bait fishing in Maine, it's gonna start coming in from out of the state. And along with that, some additional risks that, that, are, that are certainly not what we wanna see here. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of uh, outreach over the years. I can't even list it all. I think probably most people are familiar with the trouble uh, by the bucket full signage uh, that's been out there in play. I think that was our least, our most recent uh, uh, sign campaign that we've done. Um, so we have also invested in research. Um, we've supported research um, at UMaine um, on uh, methods using environmental DNA to detect uh, species of invasive fish. And um, as we start to implement our draft strategic plan, you'll see we're very um, selectively, we're planning to use some of this new technology, which basically involves taking a water sample and then testing that sample to determine if there are certain species of fish in the water or in the watershed. And we think that'll be really important on some of our, our more vulnerable uh, cold water fisheries. Um, we also are one of the few states in the Northeast New York is, is, is another one that has a um, fully certified, um, fully developed um, chemical reclamation program that's really set up to combat um, invasive introductions. So we have the ability if, and we've done this on a number of occasions, when an invasive species shows up, if it's in an important water that um, provides the um, 
the right conditions, we can actually go in and eradicate the introduced species of fish. That's typically done um, often in conjunction with um, collecting adult um, cold water fish. Like when I think of Big Reed Pond, for example, we had smelt show up there. They were out competing that char population. We removed a number of uh, adult and juvenile Arctic char. They were cultured in a facility, a fish culture facility. And uh, we went in, we eradicated the smelt. We continued to culture those, uh, the progeny and, uh, and the progeny from those hatchery reared fish were then reintroduced back into uh, Big Reed Pond to restore that. So um, we do have quite a broad suite of um, tools in our toolbox to manage invasive species. We're also looking um, uh, in the near term to partner with our sister agency, the Department of Environmental Protection on a clean uh, drain dry campaign, really to promote people to, uh, to drain their boats, their live wells, and encourage drying of gear, fishing gear and their boats uh, to reduce the risk of transporting uh, invasive aquatics, which many life stages of invasive aquatics are not easily seen by the naked eye. Uh, so that'll be another great campaign that I look forward to embarking on here in the near future. Hey, so Francis, there are so many questions coming in right now about stocking in our native fish population. So I think I'm just going to ask, um, can you talk a little bit about our stocking program and how the department enhances fisheries and also conserves fisheries? Sure. Um, so stocking in this state has, has been in existence really since the state was settled long before we had an agency. Uh, people were moving fish into the state. Um, you go back and you look in the late 1800s, uh, there was a lot more fish being moved into the state, a lot of those fish being provided by federal um, hatcheries. In the mid, uh, well, the early to mid um, 1900s, um, most of our current day fish culture facilities were, um, were established, um, certainly contributing to stocking efforts around the state. Um, our fisheries division, as I think I mentioned earlier, was established in the 1950s. So at that point, we actually had fisheries managers to help guide and direct uh, those stocking uh, programs. Um, to date, we typically stock around a million fish every year in about 800 locations. Um, and I can say that the concern and some of the conversation really stems from, you know, the fact that we've got this state that's got an abundance of native fisheries and there are some legitimate concerns about where we stock in terms of whether or not there may be interactions taking place with our native fish. I would say that our modern approach to um, stocking fully considers potential interactions. Um, we use best available science um, and in fact we've invested quite a bit working with a university on research to understand those interactions better, to help shape up our stocking policy so that any of our modern stocking initiatives um, are consistent with available science and research. Again, at the end of the day, we certainly wanna maintain the integrity and the ecological health of our native fisheries. But the reality is this, there's a lot of changes out on the landscape and a lot of the waters that may have historically been able to support native and cold water fish no longer can. And so our stocking pro programs really provide um, an important role in creating fishing opportunities where you could not, we would not otherwise have them, at least not for native fish. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to stocking to provide additional recreational opportunities where wild fish can really not make a go of it, um, we also do some conservation stocking as well. I mentioned the example over at uh, Big Reed Pond and other examples over at Wadley Pond, where again, we took char, Arctic char uh, from the wild, propagated them in a, in a private fish culture facility and then restocked them after we removed uh, an invasive introduction of uh, rainbow smelt from both of those waters. So that's an important tool that, that we also use in order to maintain um, those populations. Um, one question I would like, to, or not really a question, but it, yeah, I guess it's a question that I, I do get. Um, and people often ask about, 
you know, the fact that we stock non-native rainbow trout and non-native brown trout, you know, why would you do that in a state where there's a potential for those species to interact, you know, with our native uh, brook trout, for, for example. And, um, and the answer I offer is, um, is along the lines of this. Um, where we stock rainbows and brown trout, where we currently stock rainbows and brown trout, those tip typically are waters where our native fish are, are not able to provide um, sustainable fisheries. Um, a lot of the, the rainbow and brown trout stocking, or at least proposals for brown and rainbow trout stocking, um, they occur in waters that, again, just do not have the habitat that can support our native fisheries. And in addition, we're also, when those proposals come in for review, because every, every new stocking initiative that the department embarks on is supported by a stocking proposal, there's a rigorous review that takes place to ensure that, uh, that those new introductions, those new stocking programs are not going to adversely impact fish within those drainages. So it's a second layer of, of, of protection that's in place to, again, ensure that our native fisheries are being well cared for. And another question that's really coming in, so I, I think maybe we should just dive into it, is um, just talking about catch and release. So thinking about, uh, you know, looking at those protected waters where it's catch and release only, and then others we encourage harvest. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? There are so many questions coming in regarding that topic specifically. Yeah, this is a great topic to talk about. And, um, and when you bring it up, it reminds me of this poster that the department used to produce. And it was this poster of this adult um, with a fishing pole and he's got this creel basket and the creel basket's just overflowing with fish. And there's this little boy that walks up to him and, and asks the question, will there be any when I grow up? And, you know, there was a time and place in, in our, on our history here where, where fish harvest and consumption was, was sort of more of a way of life than it is today. Um, and certainly the pendulum has really swung in the other direction. And there's really a lot more catch and release fishing going on than there ever was. And I do wanna say that catch and release has a really important role in our management of, and conservation of, of a number of native fisheries here in the state. We typically use that approach where we have very limited uh, spawning habitat, very limited recruitment, smaller population sizes, where they can't really handle any kind of harvest um, to maintain the health and, and viability of those populations. And, 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 and so catch and release is certainly a, a, a tool and approach that we use in those kind of waters. Um, but on many other waters, um, it's not only okay for the public to be um, catching and harvesting fish that are allowed under law, but in many instances, the department's really relying upon the anglers to harvest fish to accomplish population reduction goals aimed at really creating healthier fisheries. Um, many of our special fishing regulations are designed really to, to influence and shape populations to either increase numbers or decrease numbers. And a lot of our biologists really strive to create these balanced fisheries where there's a good level of fish growth and, um, and an acceptable level of fish numbers being present and available for the angling public. In some waters, we try to manage for trophy fish where we're really looking to increase harvest so that those remaining fish have the, the fastest growth rate and are best able to, to move into those larger size classes. <coughs> Certainly the prevalence of catch and release fishing right now I mean, and it's pretty, pretty ubiquitous throughout the state is really creating some challenges in our ability to meet size quality objectives. And these are objectives, a lot of these objectives really are objectives that have been identified by the public. You know, they wanna see better quality fishing. And so the way I, the analogy I offer up is most of our lakes and ponds, all of our lakes and ponds, really, they can offer a certain amount of fish biomass. And you can decide if there's gonna be a lot of little fish or fewer bigger fish. And again, I think our, our resource biologists, they really strive to provide a balance so that there's good quality fish and there's good numbers of fish. And, uh, and that's really a, a, an impetus and, and a focus for, for our resource biologists. So I would encourage anglers who enjoy eating fish 
to eat fish, eat fish that um, whatever is provided for and allowed by law, your harvest in a lot of cases where we have special regulations, particularly bag limits and length limits, helps us actually achieve our, our size quality management objectives on those waters. Thank you, Francis. So another question that is kind of, well, I don't know if it's really a question, but people are kind of hinting at how they can get more involved in either the rulemaking process or just helping support fisheries in Maine. Do you have some suggestions for them? Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of ways the public can get involved. I think um, one of the ways and that's real timely right now is, um, again, I mentioned earlier, um, by the close of, of uh, this summer, hopefully early fall, we'll have our brand new 15 year uh, fishery strategic plan that we'll put out there for public comment and review. So folks will have an opportunity to take a look at that and, um, and our vision for, for managing into the future. So we welcome input on that. Um, a lot of the public, I don't think is aware, but all of our stocking proposals are actually posted on our website, whether they're proposals to initiate new stockings or proposals to um, eliminate stockings. Um, and uh, we do that to provide the public with an opportunity to express thoughts and concerns they have regarding those, uh, those proposals. So that's another way folks can get involved. Certainly purchasing a sportsman's license plate provides additional revenues. Um, many of those actually support some of our um, hatchery infrastructure. I think probably one of the more meaningful ways the public can get involved, and a lot of the public already is involved in this way, is by maintaining personal fishing logbooks for our, um, our fishery management regions. Um, for people that, uh, particularly for people that enjoy fishing waters that are not well fished, um, it's real challenging for the department to collect use and catch data um, on a lot of those waters. And so if you're somebody that, that likes to do a lot of fishing, particularly on maybe not so popular waters, the department's very interested in, in signing you up and having you keep records for us. And a lot of those records will really have a big influence on, on our management decisions on those waters. And the reason I, I say on those smaller waters or less known waters is because most of our ongoing data collection um, takes place on our larger, more well-known lakes like Moosehead and Sebago. Um, but it's our smaller waters, our brook trout ponds, where there's really a, a challenge getting additional information to support our management. So that's one another way. Just buying a fishing license. Um, you know, our agency um, relies on uh, licensing revenues. Um, so every time you buy a fishing license, you're in effect supporting uh, the department and department programs. Another area that I think the angling public can play a really important role, and they have, is really keeping an eye out for new strange fish that you haven't seen in the places that you enjoy fishing. We got a lot of water in this state. Our biologists can't be everywhere. So we do heavily rely on reports from the angling public on fish that they have not seen before to give us a heads up that there might be something there that, that warrants a closer look from our staff biologists. Um, another way the public can get involved is through our annual rulemaking. Um, as we uh, develop new uh, fishing regulation proposals, uh, there's a public process that we go through um, and we typically the last few years we've been using again emails we put out email blasts letting the public know hey we're going through rulemaking. You know here's the link to the proposals take a look and uh, and provide your comments. So it's another way for the public to kind of weigh in on our decision making and on our management. And maybe lastly, just bring somebody fishing be a mentor to somebody that may not have had the uh, the pleasure and experience of fishing. Um, not everybody um, grows up in an environment where they're exposed to that. And um, I think you'll find um, it can be a, a really rewarding experience. Great, Francis, thank you. So a question that just came in, we have had an extremely active chat, so I cannot guarantee that we're gonna to get to everyone's questions. I wish we could, we only have an hour. Um, I'm sure Francis, if he enjoyed this experience, we'll be on again. <laughs> so one question that came in was, uh, someone was looking for recommendations to find new spots to fish for brook trout, but they also wanna respect landowners. And I think that's super important. Do you have any recommendations for them? 
Well, a couple of, of thoughts. First of all, I appreciate the, the fact that there's an awareness regarding uh, respectful um, conduct and, and, and uh, relations with our landowners. I mean, most people probably appreciate the fact that most of our land ownership is in private ownership. So it's really important that we be responsible stewards when we're out there. And I think that's half of it. It's just half of it is just being respectful, not leaving trash and just being a good, um, a good user when you're out there recreating. So uh, if you look at our website, we've got um, a Google Earth based um, main fishing guide tool that's very helpful in actually locating where all of our, um, all of our uh, brook trout waters are statewide. If you want to know where all our pickerel ponds are statewide, you could do that as well. It's, it's a really great uh, Google Earth uh, based tool that allows you to find all those different um, opportunities that are statewide. We also have a, a document referred to the main fishing guide that also highlights uh, fishing opportunities for not only brook trout, but other species of fish. And that's all set up by, by region. But quite frankly, one of the best ways you can get a little bit of insight is just make a connection with your regional uh, fisheries biologist. Um, we've got uh, regional offices in seven different regions around the state. Uh, they're there basically to serve as uh, the front lines for the division. And, um, and they, they welcome and, and, and enjoy those conversations with the public. A lot of the time, they learn as much talking with the public as you may learn talking with our biologists. So we do have another question. We have actually quite a few questions coming in still about the stocking pro program. So if you, could you just talk a little bit more about the different types of stocking programs, such as put and take fisheries, and then also maybe where we encourage harvest? Yeah, so we do have a lot of different stocking programs. That, that could almost be a, a pretty lengthy conversation right there. <laughs> um, so some of our stocking programs are, are aimed at um, supplementing um, where we may have limited um, wild production, um, and, but production is not sufficient to maintain uh, fisheries. Um, a lot of those uh, waters that are stocked supplementally um, are typically using smaller size, less costly um, hatchery fish. Um, there's not a lot of that, but there is some of that that's, that's taking place. Um, I would say a lot of our programs are focused on waters that, um, that do not support um, cold water fisheries, native wild cold water fisheries, but provide excellent habitat to grow out trout and salmon. And in a lot of those waters, we stock at a very small size to control hatchery costs and with the expectation that those fish are gonna grow out and create these multi-age fisheries um, where you're going to see a variety and of, of sizes that, that are available to the angler. And then you go to another place where we stock um, waters that may only provide seasonal habitat. So maybe in the fall, in the winter, in the spring, when the water's cold, um, we can put fish like brook trout in those waters, which, and brook trout are a great fish because not only are they our most preferred sport fish, but they're really easy to catch. And they're, the brook trout that our hatcheries produce are just spectacular looking. So we do seek out opportunities to stock these smaller ponds with legal size fish with the expectation that those fish are gonna be harvested because they're, not, they're just simply not gonna survive in those put and take programs. And that's not why we stock there. Those waters that I had mentioned earlier, where we stock smaller sized fish with the expectation that they grow out, those are, those are being stocked in waters that provide year round habitat. And, and so we probably on most of those waters, we have special regulations that are designed to protect and conserve those, those fisheries. Put and take fisheries, we're really welcoming the opportunity to harvest. Then we also have a lot of our wild fisheries. Um, wild lake trout in Sebago Lake, wild landlocked salmon in Ziscohaz Lake, where those fisheries um, are, and those populations are so robust and so abundant, they actually exceed the available forage, fish food, smelts that, are, that can sustain those populations. And as a result, um, we are encouraging people to harvest. We've liberalized fishing regulations there on those waters to encourage people to harvest more fish. And actually, if you 
pay close attention to a lot of the rulemaking that we've embarked on in the last few years, you'll see a lot more liberalization of fishing laws and regulations. And a lot of that's aimed at trying to encourage more harvest to help the department reduce populations in some of those overpopulated waters. Okay, thank you. That was helpful information. I, I always find it really interesting to, to think about our stocking program in the hatcheries. And um, so maybe with the, the last few minutes that we have left, uh, we could talk a little bit. There are some people who have talked about introducing their, their young ones to, to fishing. Do you have some recommendations for getting new people into fishing? Yeah, um, I think really the best recommendation is really to ask somebody that you know that may already fish uh, to bring you and, and your kids out. Um, most anglers, uh, particularly those that have been doing it for a while, you know, really enjoy the sport and want to share it with others. And um, the real value in, in that and in, in hooking up with somebody that you may know that does fish is they, they can help orient, orient you to some of the fishing equipment. I think if you, you know, if you're not an angler and you, you step into, you know, one of our, our local tackle shops, you know, like Dag's Bait down in Auburn or L Bean or Cabela's or Kittery Trading Post, any of those places, it can be a little overwhelming with the amount of gear that's out there. So having somebody to help kind of orient you and kind of um, reflect on their own, their own experiences about, you know, what they find works and doesn't work is, is really a, a great way to go. Um, the other benefit to that, too, is a lot of times, you know, anglers that have been fishing for a while, they've accrued quite a bit of uh, fishing gear and, and often anglers are just looking to just get rid of it. They might sell it cheaply. They might even give, give it away <laughs> because it's just gear that, you know, is no longer in use. Um, I would suggest as another um, another tip for anglers, while brook trout are, are really a, a highly preferred sport fish in the state, um, they can be at times of the year more challenging to fish for. And if you're kind of more of a fair weather kind of uh, wannabe angler, um, you know, and you decide, oh, it's a nice, you know, July day, I'd like to go out fishing. You know, your time may be better spent focusing on warm water fish like, you know, white perch, yellow perch, chain pickerel, even bass that are more abundant and will provide more action. Um, just to kind of get you a little bit oriented to, to fishing and to have, have some success to the extent that, you know, success is measured in, in your catch. And then I guess lastly, I'd offer up, I mean, our website really has a wealth of information to the, for the public, including those that haven't begun a, 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 an interest in, in fishing. We have um, and provide real-time uh, fish stocking information so um, you'll know when our fish are being stocked, where they're available. Um, so you can be pretty much out there, you know, as the fish are being stocked. We've got a lot of how-to info and where-to info on where to go, not only just in the fishing reports that we provide, but also in our, our main fishing guide document. Um, again, I'd mentioned the Google Earth layer um, and that, that product that basically allows you, if there's a particular fish you want to fish for and you don't know where they are, just just go on that Google Earth tool and, and basically it'll show you where all those pickerel ponds are statewide. Um, so we've got a lot of a lot of great, I think, uh, tools that are available currently on our website and we're continuing to develop new tools and videos, how-to videos, next step videos as part of our, our R3 program, uh, recruitment, retention, reactivation. So we're really gearing up to provide more opportunities for people that are interested in fishing in the, in the state. And then the last, Quick tip I'll, I'll leave you with is as we approach the end of the ice fishing season, and this may not be the best year to do it because there's been quite a run on tackle sales, but typically at the end of the ice fishing season, a lot of the retailers will start to put a lot of their equipment um, on sale. So it does provide a great opportunity to pick up some good deals on fishing equipment. And March is just such a great time to go ice fishing. I know warm weather's coming and we have pretty good ice over in most of the state, but you know, I should always check when you're walking out there. So that pretty much wraps up our hour. I want to thank Francis for joining me today. I really had a good time talking with you and I feel bad we didn't get to get to all the questions. I can't believe how many questions came in. 
Uh, so I uh, definitely hope to have Francis on again so that we can try and get some more of these questions to him. Uh, thank you so much and thank you to everyone who watched. Again, this is recorded so you can watch it again later and I hope you'll join me next month. I will just continue this Coffee with MDIFW series uh, and with